All right, so welcome to your next installment of Bacterial Anatomy and Physiology. So this is part two. This is for my microorganisms and their human host class. And in this installment, we're going to learn about internal structures and also bacterial endospores. All right, so we're on to the inside of bacteria. Remember, bacteria have prokaryotic cells, and prokaryotes do not have a dedicated nucleus. They don't have a nucleus like we do that has, protects the DNA. They do have DNA, and we're going to talk about that as far as these internal structures. So getting started with number one, chromosomes. So bacterial chromosomes, how to describe what these structures, what the structure is, it's a single circular double-stranded DNA molecule. So if you can imagine, if I had a double strand, if I had a double-stranded structure and I held it up and it was circular, okay, completely circular, think of me holding a string and then dropping it onto a desk. And that is what's going to represent the bacterial chromosomes. On your picture that you see on the slide, uh, that purple structure represents the chromosomal DNA that we find inside bacteria. Now, um, that DNA that we find on chromosomes contains the essential genetic information for that bacterial cell. So all of the information stored there is going to be for um, essential processes like staying alive and, re and um, reproducing. Now, we know it's not found inside of a nucleus, but it is found in a certain region of the bacteria on the inside. And that mass is called a nucleoid. So we find bacterial chromosomes as a nucleoid inside the cell, okay? All right, another structure that we find inside of the uh, bacterial cell is called a plasmid. Now, plasmids are represented in the picture that you see as tiny circles. These are circular, supercoiled strands of DNA. And one bacterial cell could have many plasmids. These are much smaller than chromosomes, and each plasmid are different types of plasmids. So one cell may have lots of different types of plasmids. Plasmids contain genes for things like enzymes, toxins, antibiotic resistance. Uh, can I think of the, the genes on plasmids as, as extras? Okay, so these are, these are extras extra molecules that they can produce as a result of having that plasmid. All right, another internal structure of bacteria are storage granules. So if you take a look at the top picture, you see these, uh, you see a bacterial cell and you see some what looks like holes in that bacterial cell. They're not actually holes. Those are the storage granules. Um, this just, it's just not showing anything up on the slide um, because it's not staining the content of the granules. So what we're gonna find inside these storage granules are various polymers and it's storage for nutrition. So if kind of if they take in enough for their, um, for their metabolism, they can actually store some molecules for later. So it's kind of the what they take in that's excess they can store for later. Those are the storage granules. Okay, something else that we find inside bacteria are gas vesicles. So these gas vesicles, um, what they do is they allow a bacteria, they allow the cell to move up or down in a water column. So this would be very applicable to bacteria that are normally found in, a, in aquatic um, environments. Uh, bacteria can grow in, a, in bacteria can grow in let's say aquatic environments like broth, broth cultures, um, uh, and even found out in the environment. So it allows for buoyancy. 
think of a gas, these gas vesicles will allow them to um, move up or down in that water stream um, to allow for them to uh, grow at optimal. So they have these gas vesicles within the cell. All right, another internal structure of bacteria are ribosomes. Now I know you know a lot about ribosomes and ribosomes function in protein synthesis, more specifically in protein translation. We know that ribosomes read strands of messenger RNA and they hope to, they, they not hope, that they make proteins. Now, ribosomes, when we usually see them, uh, you know, we usually visualize those or they're draw put into drawings as circles, uh, but ribosomes are actually uh, come in two pieces. So there is, we call those pieces subunits. There's a large subunit and a small subunit. Now, there are different types of ribosomes based on the type of organism or really the type of cell. So bacteria are prokaryote, prokaryotes, and prokaryotes have ribosomes that are um, what are called 70S. So to, when those ribosomes are together, they're referred to as a 70S. When the large unit and subunit are together, they're a 70S. So look at the picture of that ribosome pulled apart. So the top picture. There we go. This top picture, hopefully you're seeing this little laser pointer. And if we broke it apart, those subunits for ribosomes, we have a 30S and a 50S subunit. So when they come together, they are a 70S. Now you might think, well, wait a minute, that can't be right. <laughs> that can't be right because uh, 50 plus 30 is not 70. But um, that's the number that they give it. This S stands for Svedberg. Yeah, I'm not gonna ask you about that, but just if you're interested. So Svedberg, what that, where they came up with these numbers is um, the rate of sedimentation in a centrifuge. So that's how they're getting these numbers. And I'm not gonna ask you about that. But prokaryotes um, have 30S, 5, and 50S subunits. When it comes together, they're 70S ribosomes. So they function the same as they do in our cells and eukaryotic cells. So they are at the site of protein synthesis. Um, so specifically translation or translating that messenger RNA. Now, just to compare, eukaryotic, eukaryotes uh, ribosomes are 80S in total. So bacteria, prokaryotic cells have 70S, eukaryotes have 80S. Now we're gonna talk about endospores. Some species of bacteria produce endospores. Now, endospores. Endospores are a tough, non-reproductive structure that are created by some species of bacteria, and they are a way in which that bacterial cell can go dormant. Now, Sometimes microbiologists will call endospores spores, and that term might remind you of like plant spores. Plant spores and endospores are completely different. So just kind of keep that in mind. It's, it's, they're a completely different structure. Bacterial endospores are non-reproductive structures. So there are a few different genre or genus um, of bacteria that produce endospores. And I have those listed on this slide. They are species of bacillus, species of clostridium, and species of clostridioides. When you, no, when you notice how I have that typed out, notice it's italicized, right? It's because it has to be italicized or underlined. Um, the, when I have SP after the genus name, that just means species of. 
So for example, I said species of bacillus. So all the species of bacillus will produce endospores. All right, so why would they form endospores? So what's going to trigger this vegetative cell to make an endospore? Well, a few things. So when that cell, when that cell um, experiences low carbon or nitrogen or limited nutrition or limited water, heat can trigger it and also chemical exposure can trigger it. So there's a handful of different things that can trigger these species, these cells of the species to undergo the process by which they're forming an endospore. They're going from a vegetative cell to an endospore. A vegetative cell would be one in which it is metabolizing. It's, um, it, it is uh, growing, it is, undergoing division um, that we call that a uh, vegetative cell. And so let's say it's run out of its nutrition. It's, it has very low water. Um, it's, it's reduced in the amount of carbon that's available to them. And they will uh, start undergoing the process to turn into an endospore, into that dormant state. And the process by which that occurs is called sporulation. So taking a look at the slide on your, uh, taking a look at the microscope, the picture from the microscope showing bacterial cells, I want you to look at that. A is pointing to uh, kind of a pinkish color and of a rod. And that rod is showing a vegetative cell, okay? But now look at B. So B is pointing to two structures and B is pointing to the endospore. So let's say this was a culture in a back to, in a, uh, on a Petri dish and the Petri dish was starting to dry out. There was losing, it was running out of nutrition. That those cells were running out of nutrition, low carbon, low water content, and they started to form endospores. We have a particular staining process that where we can stain and look for endospores. And that is what you're seeing in this picture of the slide. So it's coming off as kind of a bluish greenish color. And when we, for, when we stain for endospores, that's the color it comes out. So notice it's smaller than the vegetative cell. And we're gonna learn more about this process of sporulation. Okay, so the process of sporulation. All right, take a look at the image on the left over here. So when a cell is stressed for some reason, it's running out of nutrition, carbon, nitrogen, water content, those types of reasons, um, they're going to undergo sporulation. And the process by which that happens I'm not gonna hold you responsible for knowing the entire process step-by-step, step, but just in general, what's going on. Take a look at that top picture on the, uh, on the slide. So one thing that, ha the first thing that happens is that the cell itself is going to duplicate its DNA, okay? So it's gonna duplicate its DNA, then it will start adding layers to one side of the cell. So notice it starts to add layers upon layers around one part of that, one, um, one complement of that DNA. And then eventually what's going to happen is the rest of that vegetative cell will break apart, leaving um, this structure that has a hard outer shell and inside of it, you're going to find uh, DNA of that originally the vegetative cell. It's going to have a little bit of cytosol. It will have a lot of DNA. It will have the DNA. And that is the structure that we call the nitrospore.
Okay, so the process of sporulation ends in a bacterial endospore. And it's that structure that is very resistant. It's a dormant structure, but it's very resistant to many environmental conditions. Now take a look at this other picture that's taken from a microscope. <clears throat> For example, these are, uh, these are rods, so probably bacillus. And you might see something like this uh, in lab because we are gonna be working with a species of bacillus. Now, this one, when we're looking at it, we can notice the bacillus shape, the rod shaped. And notice on some of those, you see an open area in it. Okay, like maybe some of these three have kind of an open area. It's not really an open area. It's just uh, the forming of the endospore on the inside of that cell. And it's not, it's not showing up because of that. Because uh, for one reason, it's not going to stain if it's stained. And if you're seeing it live, it's just going to, it's not, going to show a color so we're not going to be able to see that if that makes any sense at all but anyway so that's what it looks like on the side when when endospores start to form um all right so we know what it looks like on the slide we know in theory what's going on and what we're ending with at the end of sporulation the process of sporulation is that bacterial endospore Okay, so remember I said that there's only three genera that will produce endospores. That is Bacillus, Clostridium, and Clostridioides. So let's say that endospores have been formed. All right, so we know why they're formed. We know how they're formed. Now let's look at, okay, once they're formed, what happens now? Well, we know that it is a dormant stage. Okay, so it stays dormant, um, but this dormant stage, this endospore is now highly resistant to a lot of extreme environmental conditions. So it's resistant to heat, they're resistant to drying out or desiccation, um, <clears throat> they're resistant to many different types of chemicals used to even kill bacteria, resistant to ultraviolet radiation, and even to the boiling process. These endospores can remain as an endospore dormant for 100 years or longer. So those, ex those hard outer shell layers that get developed can stick around for many, many years. And it's only when the environmental conditions return for that endospore do they start to lose that hard outer shell it breaks it down, and then that cell can now become vegetative. So even if that endospore has been around for 100 plus years, if we give it the right nutrition and the right water content, then it can dissolve that endospore, come out of the dormancy, and start to replicate again. Okay? Pretty wild. Now we find endospores virtually everywhere. Everywhere we're gonna find endospores. Um, we'll find them in the soil, we'll find them, in, find them in your house. So lots of different places in which we're gonna find that endospore. All right, so I believe this is our last slide of, um, of this particular lecture. So this concludes our internal structures of bacterial anatomy and physiology.